Welcome to my world. Two escargot, pate, frise, two green salads. Okay, man, it's not here. Lamb chop, steak street. Shouldn't you be doing something? Two faux filet and a pepper steak. Come on, make the dessert. Chocolate tart, please. As a cook, tastes and smells are my memories. And now I'm in search of new ones. So I'm leaving New York City and hope to have a few epiphanies around the world. And I'm willing to go to some lengths to do that. I am looking for extremes of emotion and experience. I'll try anything. I'll risk everything. I have nothing to lose. Melbourne, Australia. Melbourne, the epicenter of the new frontier, the, the new Wild West of cooking. This is a place where, well, some pioneers came and created something where before there was nothing. The potential here has attracted chefs and restaurateurs from near and far, encouraging them to stretch the boundaries of the ever-evolving Australian cuisine. Two beef, well done, medium rare, veiled pigeon pink. And like the American West, it's got a gunslinger attitude towards chefs. We're rough, very rough around the edges, and that's, that's a good thing about it, you know, but the food is not rough around the edges. crossing tradition with new world in Australia. A wild and lawless place. Well, okay, maybe not so wild and lawless, but in no place, in no place else in the world, the chefs enjoy the kind of latitude, the kind of freedom from restriction that this place has. This is a place where the only rule still is to be good, where justice comes not for the barrel of a gun. Anyone got to sell it? We're not each other one file. From a sharp knife, a squeeze bottle, a metal ring, and what's in your heart, what you can do with food. These culinary early settlers that paved the way, were they pressed onward by potential for riches, driven forward by an unbridled passion for creating great food and restaurants? Absolutely. Perched on a small hill overlooking a valley carpeted with grapevine sits a somewhat imposing little house on the prairie. It's the home of restaurateur and winemaker Ronnie D'Astasio, an early pioneer in the Melbourne food scene. Because our culture is such a young one, we don't have any guidelines, so we're free. We're developing our culture. Right. Ronnie recognized Melbourne's potential early on, opening Cafe Stasio in what was once the middle of nowhere. Salve. Salve. He is a food baron who knows how to enjoy himself. Today, he's hosting a lunch at his country home. And the guests include some fellow pioneers, who are, by the way, some of Australia's greatest chefs. So more than fusion, it's about evolution here in this country, you know? Neil Perry, chef owner of Rockpool Restaurant. We got a passion we got run the restaurant. Tetsuya Wakuda, chef owner of the world famous Tetsuya. We're trying actually to change the face of the restaurant business in this country. And Armando Percoco, chef owner of Juan Ricardo. Down here, you've got chefs drawing on influences and product from all over the Pacific Rim in Asia, and restaurateurs with unbridled ambition, always looking to keep old customers and make new ones. We've got Asians, we've got Europeans, we've got the stuff growing in the ground here. We have the local customer who's patronizing us all the time, and we have to look after very much those customer, otherwise you're losing your job. Do you think chefs uh, listen to what the market is enough? If you want to make money and stay in business and employed as a chef, you have to. The market is gone because it's the market that enables me to do Italian food. However, if the market swings tomorrow and they want Indian, tomorrow morning I will <laughs> wear a turban and it'll be f***ing tandoor chicken because I want to stay in business running a restaurant. No, That's what I, I don't believe you. No, I don't believe no, you. Believe me. No. This is an opinionated group and they have every right to be. Their food, their hard work, talent has changed the world around them. If you're thinking it's just shrimp on the barbie around here, you should be kicked in the head, mate. We are really comfortable with everything that we do here. We're really relaxed. We're not trying to be anybody else but ourselves. With all respect of the Italians and the French, I think we have a fantastic food in this country. We've got a little bit more to go to understand that four 
passion, mm -hmm. and that's what we put in. I mean, we really put our on the line. I'm not kissing your here. I, I seriously, I would eat in Melbourne before Paris any day, any day. Salute. Well, nice to meet you. Yeah, yeah. we have the same. Ma quando mangiamo? Let's go. Hey, quando mangiamo? Ah, the joys of a simple rustic lunch with a few friends. You know, this business has always attracted a certain type of person who's passionate about something already. Look, we have a common denominator. First up, homemade chicken and veal-filled capoletti with chicken broth. I mean, it's like one big inbred hillbilly family. We've all had each other's sisters. Yeah, he did. He did. The world. Of course, we have. No, we all steal. I don't mean steal, but you're influenced by yes, influence. those who came before no, no, you. Yes, influence. No, 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 that's beautiful. Influencing by other chefs. No one is more passionate about food, or life for that matter, than people in the restaurant. After work, after work, we cook together. Right. Secondi uccelli al forno, quail and spatchcock, which is three-week-old chicken, oven-roasted with grapevine leaves, garlic, rosemary, and olive oil. Nice. Yes, yeah, so I love this. Look at the grape leaves. It's very good. You know what I said before about the Indian turban? Forget it. <laughs> I just do it for the passion. I just do it. Forget it. It's wrong. Finally, the main course. Cignale con radicchio. Slowly cooked boar with wine, sage, and apples with wilted radicchio. Anthony, what do you think of my wine? It's the 2001 vintage here. Yeah. Okay. That's, what, that's what you're drinking. Um, I knew before I came to Australia that, that Australian wine was good. I knew it was really, really good. I had no idea how good. Until this moment. It's what the French call terroir. Terroir. Okay, because it's not just what you're eating. It's not just what you're drinking. It's who, it's who, I can't, I, I, it's I, I, who, I can't talk. I'm gonna cry. Salve. I'm you just know? happy to be in this group's company, enjoying some really fine Australian food and wine. As I expressed explicitly to him, if someday Don Distasio calls upon me to do him a favor, I will definitely be there. Life is good. I'm happy. I mean, it kind of looks like the great American West, doesn't it? Uh, you know, when you're talking about new frontiers of food, this fits right into our theme. It looks like a cowboy country. And we've even got cows. Or is that a steer? Oh, I'll find out. Let me see. Yeah. Steer. <laughs> To have a gold rush, you need gold. To have a foodie gold rush, you need raw ingredients and people who know what to do with them. We're gonna to talk to Richard Thomas today, who is responsible for a large sector of that good ingredient. There's no room for compromise on the steak, is the way I see it. Richard makes cheese, and he has some passionate views on the subject of cheese. In fact, this is a sort of a pet project, pet passion of mine, the whole safety versus flavor issue, and I'm sure he has a lot to say on that. Cheese factory. Richard is the wild man of Australian cheese. He's been passionate about cheese making for over 30 years. 1971, backyard in a working class suburb in Melbourne. And I just bought a piece of Gorgonzola Dolce Latte. It was a changing point in my life. I went from scientist to cheese maker without even having a choice in the matter. Ever wondered, what do I want to do with my life? Meet a man who knows what he wants. So what are we making here? Uh, we're making boccaccini here. What's happening here is the cheese has been fermented by quite a natural process. When it arrives at exactly that spot, and Joe knows when that is, he dumps pieces of curd into the boiling water, at which point it's stretched, and you get the strands of protein. When they're at the right consistency, the machine fires up, and you'll see it moulds the cheese into small balls, a work usually done by hand. He's the master, cheese master. Want to get a good cheesemaker excited? Ask him about pasteurised cheese. I usually kiss people that ask me that question. It first of all destroys all of the range of flavour-producing bacteria that come naturally in the milk. Well, you know, bacteria is not a bad thing. The story of food is a story of, of, of fermentation, rot, and, and, and uh, gamesmanship with those dark forces. You are exposed to no bacteria on a regular basis. When you eventually are exposed, you will, of course, get ill. I mean, if you, if you live in a, a hygienic, shrink-wrapped shrink world, and then travel to Mexico and have a, a decent taco at a, in, a, in a street stand, one of life's great pleasures, by the way, uh, you will, of course, fall ill because you're not used to it. There's very powerful resistance to making raw milk cheeses in this country. Right. Okay. As, in, as in America, it's technically illegal. You virtually, nowadays, 
have to break the law to really enjoy yourself. The greatest cheeses in the world, undeniably, are made from raw milk. I get a kind of madman, maverick type of reputation. You know, I can't compromise on flavour, for example, with cheese, and this is why I get angry with those people that would, would want to crush the flavour out of everything that we do. Flavour is the essence of food. Richard knows what he's talking about, and I think he's absolutely right about everything. This is the kind of intensity and focus behind every great ingredient, every great chef, and a lot of great meals. This is the most delicate of all cheeses, a goat fromage blanc. A vital part of good cheese making is the gentle way, and particularly goat milk, the way you handle the curd. Right. Everything has to happen slowly. Only people with the greatest of confidence can uh, have the courage to, to serve something very, very simple. Ah, oh, fresh bocconcini. Doesn't come any fresher than that, I can tell you. Still warm. Oh, it's lovely. Mm. The future for our cheeses is really to pump more flavour into them, to get them to always have the aim of, of looking at the, what the best that is around and saying, let's try and equal that. This is a guy not just fighting to win, but a guy fighting for what he really believes in. The last frontier, as far as I'm concerned, is that of fermented foods. My responsibility is to continue to push those boundaries of flavour. Richard's not alone in his unflinching pursuit of flavour. There are others. Melbourne seems to attract them. Don't think in only money, money, money. Only think in to do the right things. And that is good for, the, for, for everybody. Like Angel Cardozo. A former NASA engineer turned jamon and sausage maker. 20 years took me to the prosciutto. I make the ham, the dry jamon. The operations center is in the basement of his home. To do this type of food, you have to be out of the industrial uh, you know, factories. Only open air from the windows is used in the curing process. And it's the only way to get the natural taste. Anyway, come into the room here, says, and after I show you another one. Look the aroma, the smell. Oh, look at this. This is jamon, the Spanish version, frankly, the better version of Italian prosciutto. Look at these, my god. I love the smell in here, too. <laughs> <laughs> these ones were the first ones I started to make in Australia. Very good, because this is no cholesterol. Angel tells me that jamon, when it's been cured for over a year, has no cholesterol. Very good for our health. Did I hear that right? No cholesterol in year old cured meats? The Americans are very afraid of fat. If he's not fat, he's not taste. Yeah, and no texture, nothing. Well, that's something very special, isn't it? Well, that's good. Great taste, nice smell. The fat for me is the best. Yeah, me too. Speaking of fat, a little something to eat. Homemade salami, jamón with melon, and a Spanish tortilla, an omelet with potato, onion, and chorizo. Yeah, real, real flavor. Yeah. The fruits of over 20 years of hard work. Yeah. Um, I knew this was going to be great before we even sat down. This is the way heaven should look, you know? Lots of beautiful pork products hanging from hooks. Never mind heaven. It should look like this on Earth all the time. You know the old wives' tale, young gunslingers don't make good chefs? It ain't true. Even though I'm an old fart myself, I guess my sympathies are always gonna lie with the, the young Turks. One large yabby in a claw. Two dry, one veal, one beef, medium rare, one spinach. Husband and wife team Donovan and Philippa Cook are the new guard. They're doing some extraordinary work at Melbourne's Ondine restaurant. Smash, tall any quail, chicken veal. Yes. What are we going on next, please? Both Philippa and Donovan were classically trained in France and England. Where I come from, it's uh, fish and chips. None of this I think Donovan is a natural, a genius. Yeah. Uh, are we dressed in here or what? His sauces are second to none. We need to move it now, huh? We're gonna go down, kids. Tonight, Donovan is short-staffed. Philippa is having dinner with me. It's so out of here. <laughs> It's a fairly rowdy bunch out here. There is this sort of Wild West gunslinger, sort of uh, new frontier thing yeah. going on here that I find really refreshing. It's a performance yeah. in the chef's staff. These two are sourcing the best ingredients Australia has to offer and using techniques both classic and new. What gets them in the door the first time yeah, is the chef. The chef. What, well, obviously, what keeps them coming back is the food. You know, in certain other cities where chefs are rushing to get hairstylists and voice coaches and media <laughs> trainers and elocution teachers, I don't see a lot of that here. Can you see Donovan being packed off to media training? Scorch, scorch, you 
f***ing spinach. You don't want to f***ing season them, man, or what? Send it, and f*** off back to your section. Are you going to f***ing answer me? Where is it? When I first met Donovan, I thought, he, I thought he was quite cosmopolitan and quite sophisticated, but it's only because I didn't understand what he was saying. <laughs> so as soon as we've got them on trades out of the way, well, let's start banging some hands out. It's all going to go down, eh? No, nah, mate. No, I don't fully understand what he's saying, but I do know that he speaks through his food. His talent is in combining new and unexpected ingredients and flavors. Case in point, first course, which marries three different appetizers to three different champagnes. What we're having here is an oyster truffle and lettuce soup. That goes with the Australian sparkling, which is called Piri, followed by a tartare of comfy tomato and apple with a yabby, which is a little crayfish. And then the last one there is a quail egg, quail jelly with a foie gras cream. It is beautiful. I have a thing for quail eggs. This is food that comes out of the French system. But, you know, we're looking at yabbies here. You, would you describe it as French food, or how would you describe it? Yeah, I'd describe it as modern French. Isn't but it? But we tend not to describe it also. We're doing our own thing. We're doing what we like to eat. You know, we're doing, we're doing what we're good at. Every sauce here is cooked, reduced, finished to order. Sauces made to order. That's the essence of the kind of two and three star joints these two come from. I understand that every time I pick up a, a chef's knife, that I owe everything to centuries of French trial and error and tradition. Donovan was an immediate you know, good guy to me because he's of that system and yet in front of that system by his very un-Frenchness. I told you we're going on this table fast. The fact that he's not ready for prime time resonates with my own shameful sellout. <laughs> This is Tony's next course, a courgette flower, or zucchini, whatever you call them in your country, stuffed with prawn and horseradish farce, diced tomatoes, tiny basil leaves, and a tomato consomme, poured at the table. This is beautiful. It's just fantastic flavor. What they're having now is a smart barramundi, which is stained, we do it ourselves. Parsley essence, crispy pancetta, snails, confit shallots, little sauteed potatoes, with an egg poached in red wine. Eggs poached in red wine. I didn't see that coming. God, it's beautiful. God, look at that. Unbelievable. And I just saw it in the egg first, it runs all over them. Oh, yeah. oh yes. It's pornographic, isn't it? <laughs> it is extraordinary. It's all the things I love about a dish. It's new, it references the classics. Uh, it's a local fish, and there's bacon involved. This is uh, the main course now, pigeon. We're trying to braise the mushrooms rather than saute them so they go crispy, so they're nice, spongy texture. So all we've got here is some truffles that I got before. I preserve them, reduce it, finish with a teaspoon full of cream. So what we've got is pigeon, celery gnocchi, fricassee mushrooms, peri ghost sauce, and a shiitake foam. Plump, red, juicy, delightful, studded with truffles. Things could be a lot worse. <laughs> I'm running out of adjectives. I mean, Jesus, it's... <laughs> We, have I have I've used ethereal, magnificent, extraordinary, fantastic, delightful? No, sublime works for me. All right, I'm out of adjectives and I still have one more course to go. It's all the main course for a while, and I just got what, one, two, three, four, five entrees tonight. Let's go, then. Let's get the garnishes. Time for the final course. And this is all Philippa's department. I do the pastry stuff because he doesn't have to. Beautifully conceived and executed desserts. Like the pyramid of strawberry sorbet. I'm doing a pyramid. This is nougatine. It's made with um, fondant and almonds, which gets um, placed on the outside. And it's filled with um, almond parfait glacé with raspberries and strawberries. Oh, that's beautiful. It's got a Pink Floyd crash into this, you know? It really is. Uh, I'm just to read. Like oh, man. It's beautiful. It's, it's, it, this is one of those kill me now desserts. This normal white fondant, caramelized really slowly, and then poured over toasted almonds and flash it in the oven so that it melts. It's it, it is. It's really good. Yeah, but it really tastes good. So many pastry chefs would. This would be construction material for them and not something utterly delicious. 
and beautiful. So good. These two truly deserve to be recognized, so take notice. Let's go see El Jefe. How was the pigeon like that? It was sublime. Worth a 20-hour flight from New York just for this. There's a special place in heaven for you, man. You're getting in. Melbourne, Australia, the final frontier. Like the American West, it's a place where you can come from far away and reinvent yourself. And like the American West, it's got good stuff waiting for people to discover. There may be no other place in the English-speaking world where chefs and food are so enthusiastically embraced as this place right now. I think it's one of the most exciting places to eat and certainly one of the most exciting places to cook on this planet. Oh, forget it. I'm not ready to leave just yet. We really wanted to have a, an Aussie barbie. Donovan and Philippa convinced me that my Melbourne trip wouldn't be complete without honoring an Australian cliche, throwing some shrimp on the barbie. This is my son, my three, three and a half year old son. You remind me of my baker. This is why I don't have bread bakers in my, in my restaurants. <laughs> in the backyard, with ambiance vastly removed from Ondine's, they barbecue for friends and family on days off. We're going to cook. We love our food and we love our wine. We're having some fabulous wines. We usually get pretty pissy on Sundays. <laughs> so what we're eating now is crayfish. Just gonna barbie them up, serve them with a salad of green beans and a sauce called Wa Bourdain. Wa Bourdain? Meet Tony Bourdain. Ketchup, Worcester sauce, Tabasco, shallots. Isn't it great? It looks lovely. Next to the backyard grill, Donovan exhibits a refined ability with food that clashes with an informal vocabulary and tales of humble beginnings. I left school at 15. My nickname was Man. I had one pair of chef pants, which I didn't try on. So I looked like Iggy Pop in the 80s, skin tight and a cucumber hanging down. Nonetheless, Donovan moved quickly up the ranks. The first assessment I got, I got double distinction again. He said I was the best socio I'd ever had in 25 years in the kitchen. Right. One minute I was socio, next minute I was the head chef. You take your sauces seriously. And he takes his grilling seriously, too. Look at that. Most important thing with crayfish, I noticed over here, everybody likes to boil it until it's, like, nice and papery. So I blanched this for, like, one and a half to two minutes. Then you can just sear it, and it's still opaque in the middle, which means it's still moist and tender. The crawfish are great, but this wouldn't be Barbie without the steak. This the uh, Australian version of, like, the Colby beef. Chefs of Donovan's caliber could grill steaks in their sleep. Can you get me a tray for this, mate? It's time to eat up, but not before we thank the chef. <laughs> still, got, <laughs> still got the magic. It's great. Life is good. They don't call the test, you've all the food, now f off, make sure the door's shut. 